Um, I think I'm here to tie up the two really information dense and amazing presentations that came before me. And I'm aware it's me standing between you guys in your break and a mental break, which is super important. So I'm going to try and use less time and then we can get to the panel. Um, but I'm here to tie these things all together and kind of say, okay, well, what does this potentially mean for conservation financing as a whole in the NWT context and specifically around Indigenous-led conservation? I'll just begin by saying really briefly the, uh, about the International Boreal Conservation Campaign and the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, who we are. Um, the International Boreal Conservation Campaign is a network of philanthropy and environmental organizations that have come together to fund and really try and foster and build the capacity of an indigenous-led conservation across Canada. One of the mechanisms they use to develop this, I might, yeah, I don't have a lot of text on my slides, but one of the tools they used to develop this was to create the Indigenous Leadership Initiative to create a platform for really amazing experienced leaders, uh, Indigenous leaders across Canada to go out there and promote the cause. Uh, the NWT Indigenous leaders are Ethel Blond and Andrew and Steve Nita. But through, um, as you know, we as groups came together to discuss the strategic mission and how this thing would work, talking about you know, what does decolonization mean for us, this, this format of having these US-based philanthropists and organizations you know, kind of dictating how we fund these things started to not sit right. And so one of the decisions that has been made, and, and there's a transition going on, was that the Indigenous Leadership Initiative itself would actually become the board of directors or the managers of the funds provided by the International Boreal Conservation Campaign. So we're in this transition phase now where Steve Kallick, the director of um, the International Boreal Can Conservation Campaign, and Valerie Courtois, the director of the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, are co-directing with the ultimate aim of within the short term or medium term that this will now move into the purview of the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. <coughs> So I wanted to begin by that kind of statement of who we are and how we really see ourselves working in the North and across Canada to promote Indigenous-led conservation. But the bigger picture is that um, Canada as a whole, we've seen in the last 10 years, is increasingly supportive of Indigenous-led conservation. And many opportunities have aligned to create this atmosphere, but it's a really unique opportunity in the North that we should be taking um, the best advantage of that we can. We've seen the concept of conservation be redefined to include support and even celebrate traditional uses of land, indigenous culture, and values. Um, land use plans in these negotiated government to government agreements are being forged that are bridging difficult long-term issues of land zoning, ownership, and control. But the challenge now is to find adequate financing for these greatly expansive, expanded vision of what indigenous-led conservation looks like. Um, the factors driving this change are that the earth, we've heard before, the earth is suffering from alarming, increasing environmental degradation, but many of the world's healthiest ecosystems are indigenous homelands, and this isn't an accident. So examples include the Amazon rainforest, the Australian outback, the si Siberian taiga, and the Canadian boreal forest and Arctic tundra. Indigenous stewardship is a major reason that these places remain healthy, and protecting and wisely managing, managing these last great places is one of the best and also most affordable ways to slow climate change and sustain nature, in our opinions. So, Looking back, we talked a bit yesterday about the Convention on Biological Diversity. We talked a lot about how it began this transformation of in recognizing indigenous peoples within these big global international agreements. Um, but it also has uh, looked at, folk focused on the world's remaining intact and healthy ecosystems. And, and through that, over the last 20 years and 30 years, we've seen this integration of indigenous peoples and intact ecosystems coming together. The CBD has a lot of protected area targets. Uh, we saw that the Canada Nature Fund was kind of launched by the CBD in Canada's international commitment to protect 17% of lands and waters by 2020. But in 2019, our Prime Minister went further, promising 25% by 2025, which requires protecting an area uh, double the size of Manitoba. Um, the current policy of Canada's government uh, is officially reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, and this is, you know, a challenging thing that they're trying to do, and in different realms it looks different. 
But the Constitution and laws of Canada require honourable, meaningful consultation and accommodation of Indigenous rights. Canada has endorsed the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2016, um, and UNDRIP requires enhanced consultation, including consent to decisions impacting uh, indigenous peoples. And this old style of creating protected areas, such as imposed national parks or wildlife uh, areas, is outmoded and fundamentally inconsistent with indigenous rights. Um, indigenous led conservation meets these twin objectives of protecting nature and respecting indigenous stewardship and rights. We've seen uh, the Northwest Territories and other parts of Canada have developed these indigenous-led land use plans, and these are, have been critical for zoning areas, both for development and protection, and this is usually the first step before you develop an indigenous protected and conserved area. Areas that we protect can now be designated as IPCAs in parallel with their other government protections, like we've seen with Thaidan and Nene and Adeje. They are both territorial protected areas, but they are fundamentally indigenous-led in terms of their management and what goes on there. Uh, in gr these agreements often include funding for local indigenous guardians to assume uh, traditional cultural responsibility of stewards of their land. Um, in terms of how to fund it, the federal government funds are currently the major source and we believe likely to remain so for far into the future. Uh, philanthropic foundations have played a key role with early investments in land use planning, guardians, and setting up indigenous protected and conserved areas using grants and endowments. Corporate contributions such as impact benefit agreements uh, and other deals have been critical in specific cases and will remain important, but in specific cases, not really we're not really able to apply this generally across the territory. We have heard a lot this morning about the potential of private market transactions for carbon sequence sequestration, storage, or biodiversity credits, and how these could become important sources of revenue in the future. And tourism will also provide some revenues, but it's not usually substantial. So the Government of Canada has supported Indigenous-led conservation in various ways. I'll begin by talking about the Nature Fund. Um, protecting nature costs money to manage and maintain, whether it's by Parks Canada or Indigenous Guardians. More protection will require more investments. The Nature Fund set aside $1.2 billion in 2018 to help pay for expansion of protected areas. They have distributed to date about $175 million in 2019. Uh, and those grants were to help establish IPCA and associated guardians. And this has been the biggest source within the country to date for IPCAs. Um, and substantial funds remain to be expended and we're all waiting with bated, bated breath to see when that will be. Um, in countries like Australia, long-term government funding of indigenous conservation and guardians is the most stable source of revenue and jobs in those areas. And the social impact has been studied and you know, is amazing. Uh, in terms of government support for guardians, in parallel to the Nature Fund, they developed a Guardians Network pilot project in 2017 with about 25 million. This has been another source of revenue for creating guardians, but it's been, when you look at what the NWT got, it was very small, much less than what we re NWT received in the Nature Fund, but it's more flexible funding. It expires in 2021, but we are pushing alongside many other partners to renew that funding at a higher level and to, for it to be collaborated more closely with the movement to create indigenous protected areas and support land use planning. Uh, in terms of the other sources, foundations, corporate, and other new sources of funding, uh, charitable foundations in the NWT have been great friends and not enemies of the NWT. There is you know, skepticism and controversy, I think, amongst other sectors of the NWT on how these funds have been used and whether or not they're hampering the economy. And Steve has written here in big, bold letters, Vivian Krauss is dead wrong. Um, tens of millions of dollars have been donated to support Indigenous land use plans, planning and management of new IPCAs and guardians, and opening up these lands as well. Foundations are nimble and can help launch new projects at the front end, and then provide funds with very little paperwork or restrictions. And one of the things we work really hard to do as we support funding going directly to First Nations in the NWT is try to provide stable funding that's predictable, that has low reporting burdens, because we feel 
feel it's really important in small communities with limited capacity that you have time to actually do your jobs and are not just filling out paperwork to get more funds or to tell us how you spent the funds. Um, our ability to do that is also limited based on who we're working with, but it's an important thing we try to send upstream. Uh, foundations are not generally able or willing to provide long-term funding or to equal government contributions. They, we found it difficult with the, with the groups we were supporting in the Nature Fund to make up that 20% match funding for each of our partners. Um, endowments like we've seen for Thiden and NA to a lesser extent at Deje or the Great Bear Rainforest are very rare exceptions. And so the fact that we've seen a couple be created in short term might create an, expect an expectation that this is something that we can model out for future protected areas in the NWT. And I know it's Steve's opinion that this just won't happen. Um, and, and that's debatable, and I'd love to debate it in the panel coming up. In terms of corporate funding, um, IPCAs and Guardians have relied on corporate funding through impact benefit agreements and development agreements. One of the first Guardian programs in the Innu Nation in Newfoundland and Labrador was partially funded by an impact benefit agreement. If you look at Boots on the Ground or other monitoring programs in the Clicho, those a significant source of funding has been their corporate partners with impact benefit agreements. Um, the Adeje Guardians program was jump-started by en Ember and in Labrador, it was the Vosies Bay mine. General revenues from industrial development can help underwrite stewardship of nearby protected areas to achieve a be better balance or mix of funding. Indigenous leaders should look to create government, foundation, and corporate partnerships to create a stable base of funding across a diverse set of donors. Um, oh, and then in terms of new sources, we've heard a lot about that. Um, and there's a real movement to look towards what are the natural climate solutions that we can use to pay to preserve existing forests and wetlands. Um, Non-government private carbon transactions are starting. We are seeing on the BC coast people actually getting money. And there's potential around biodiversity conservation credits. Those have also been sold in private transactions in other countries and possibly this could emerge in Canada. Um, other NGOs exploring the potential for green bonds and other new financial instruments is another way to fund nature conservation, which we already heard. So can protected areas become the NWT's green gold? Um, from our perspective, the NWT and its indigenous peoples possess a wealth of increasingly valuable and rare resources. The wildlife is abundant. The forests are healthy. Waters and wetlands are everywhere. And I know we've talked a lot about how we've seen changes, and th this is not to minimize those changes, but this is to say that in terms of impact, human impact on the landscape, uh, there, there is very little population, and it's, it's a really rare um, value and asset on this earth. These resources are only going to become more scarce. Government, foundations, corporations, and others are probably going to be increasingly willing to invest money in protecting them, even though we've heard um, the previous speakers talk about how they still have to make this case, which is so obvious to us. Indigenous-led land use planning clears the path for major corporate developments by creating stability, social consensus, and then revenue. And we've seen what happens in Canada when there are shortcuts that are tried to be made around really securing um, Indigenous consent. IPCAs increasingly provide well-paid, stable guardian jobs in remote areas that keep people in contact with their culture, and it honors and continues Indigenous cultures and traditions, and the social impact of this goes far beyond uh, just the money it costs uh, in investment. And I think that's all I have to say. Thanks. <laughs>